are listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. The Exorcist franchise. The Exorcist. Welcome to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its purpose is to look into horror films, dissecting them one screen legend or franchise at a time. Our podcast subject for this particular episode is dedicated to The Exorcist. Check that out. Is it Van Jules? Van Jules? No, no, no. Who is it? No, Some it's Mike Holfield. Mike Holfield. Oh, okay. Tickle of Bells. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. I thought, I don't know why I thought he You know why I had a compilation CD and themes, instrumental thing? Yeah, yeah. Van Jules is on that CD as well. Yeah. So you, you want that spade now to help dig you out of the hole that you just... That's what I thought it was. Dug yourself. <laughs> How's it in? Well, I mean, chances are it was the 80s or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Chances are it was either Bang No, or it was Jean-Michel right. Jarre, I oh, tell yeah. you. Yeah, okay. yeah, I've got one of his albums. I've got an Oxygen. Oh, I love Not that. <laughs> Shelly tells me this. I just want to listen to the bit from Gallipoli. <laughs> nice. The Exorcist. Wow, so the, the, the nut of it is, is that there's uh, a woman, she's uh, living in George, Georgetown. Is yes. that right? Yeah. She's living in Georgetown in, in the USA. She's a, an actress um, and uh, she has a teenage daughter who. Uh, Regan. Regan. Yeah. And. Uh, nice. And she starts showing signs of being possessed, but at the point where they just kind of, at the start of it, feel like it's just teenage kind of acting out, out, acting out and yeah. stuff. There's lots of like experiments that are put on her because I think it's um, a medical condition. They do, yeah. and then that's she has, like, um, early Tourette syndrome or something. Yeah, like that, like, you're fucking. She does yeah. some weird shit, and I think it's a brain. Awaying herself, like she stands yeah. there and says, you're, gonna, you're all going to die. <gasps> yes, and pieces. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Um, and then, like, none of that works. All the science kind of stuff doesn't work. And it keeps kind of going on, and it kind of leads her down to a path that is her daughter possessed. Mm-hmm. And at which point she calls in uh, a priest, uh, played by Jason Miller, Father Karras. Mm-hmm. And uh, he comes in and does the initial kind of uh, consult. consult, yeah. And he kind of believes that there could be uh, signs that it is a possession. And then we get the exorcist arrive. Uh, Bye-bye, Max. But- yeah, right. one side right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he turns up, and uh, and the ex- exorcism is performed. That's kind of like uh, that's it in a very quick nutshell. So that's thank you very much for the. We're getting pizza. Um, so uh, I know in the past, like, um, and I was just explaining this to Miles because you've been absent for a little while. Yes. Um, on these ones, Miles has been on tour. Oh, he's been on tour. He's been kind of yes. with a different troupe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> podcast troupe. <laughs> <don't> podcast <laughs> troupe. You bastard. <laughs> um, but. Uh, the general, because I'm trying to look at things a bit differently, mix things up a little bit, and with the franchise stuff, because what I want to do is then talk about, Exor- uh, not in this podcast, but in the next one, talk about Exorcist 2, The Heretic, yeah. and Exorcist 3 um, in one podcast sitting, and then talk about the prequels, Exorcist The Beginning and Dominion. Mm-hmm. Um, the prequel to oh, the I Exorcist. I haven't seen Dominion. What's that one? It's, uh, yeah, is that it's, the alternate? Huh? One's an alternate to the first film, right? No, they're two different, oh, they're two different, they're different, two different movies. Uh, oh, didn't but they both fo- follow Father Merrin's journey before all of this happens that we're about but to talk didn't about. One the first one, the beginning is the one with Stalin Skarsgård. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Max von Sydow. And yeah. that's the one that he, they completely reshot, though, didn't they? I yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, that's that was happened, the one yeah. that got really botched up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that could have been really good, that one. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've since released the one that they replaced it with. Or something. Oh, really? It's not that much better. Oh, I, I don't think. Uh, well, that's well, that's what we want to talk about down the track. So, like, but I thought we'd just talk around this one and um, and mainly talk about the themes that kind of come up um, that 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 are running throughout the film. But also, you know, take a particular nod to uh, I really want to talk about the director within the movie he's as a, well. He's a favourite of yours for <laughs> one particular incident, William Friedkin. That you love. Um, so, like, I do, but I do want to touch on that. Maybe not just this moment, but do want to talk about. Uh, and it's come up before when we spoke about Wes Craven's first film, uh, Last House on the, House on the Left. Mm. Um, can you push an actor push too line. far yeah, <laughs> and yeah, cross yeah. the line on certain yeah, things? Because yeah. um, it is something that happens quite a lot in this movie. So I'd, I'd like to touch base on that. I'd like to, as I say, talk about the, the dark and light themes that run through it. Mm. Massively have to talk about all the effects that took place because this is all pre-CGI yeah. um, stage. And some of the stuff in there is is. It's just amazing what they managed to Dick pull off. Smith, isn't it? Dick Smith's yeah. makeup, yeah, yeah. Um, I just and, thought he had the chair of the electronic stores. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. A guy. Well, yeah, 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 I know exactly. That's what he went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Just yeah. make up. And, and then whatever we want to talk about along the way, really, I just kind of want to kind of kick back and have it a bit more relaxed kind of feel to this one. Does it have to be about the film? It has to be about the film. Yeah, we have to talk about the exercise. Should have put the brackets on there. Okay, all right, fine. Um, my first thought. I'm sorry. Dude. No, no, no. That's exactly <laughs> it. So, what's a film? It's a film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 no, no. Like, is it a film? Yeah, it is. <laughs> the, um, so what what we should uh, you're right what we should talk about first is uh, first memory that you have of it and first uh, oh, uh, reaction that you had from, that you can remember from watching it the very first time okay Miles you go I, I actually remember watching this for the first time because I had never seen it and I heard so much uh, like shit about how scary it was mm. and and then I I came to Australia when I was about 16, 17 and I was around at this friend's place, and they had it on. They go, oh, we've got The Exorcist on VHS. I'm like, oh, cool, I've never seen this. They go, it's really scary. And I'm like, really? And I sat there and watched it, I went, I wasn't scared a single bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, when does, where is the scary part? Mm, yeah, yeah. And I was this just is... watching it, and I was going, fuck, this is really good, though. It's like, yeah. it's very, so you like... enjoyed it as a film? Yeah, yeah, look, it was really solid, because I, I loved Ken Loach stuff at the time, so that's oh. some neorealism stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I, and that, I loved the 1970s uh, the uh, film. American New York yeah. films. Yes, you know, yes, you know, yes, yes. Like, yes. Lumet and, and, um, and Friedkin, and, and Even just, like, like naturalistic di- dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. so I really, I, I so dig that, and... Um, and so I was watching it, on, and especially the bits where you know when, when um, what's her face, the uh, the actress, uh, who plays mom, uh, Ellen Burstyn, yes, yeah. yes, uh, who um, and she's acting on on in the distance and yeah. people are watching and yeah. and she comes over and and gives everybody an autograph, even a, a father, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Is there and she's that's it, autograph, and everybody's just sort of everything's so casual and real, and yeah. Just go, Holy shit! And then the, every, all the dialogue's quite naturalistic yeah. as well. And I was like, "No, this is a really quality film." Yeah. But then, so that's you when. Scared, that. That, no, so, so that I could see what when they sort of threw the kibosh on things and everything turned into this sort of supernaturally thing. It just was so clever to yeah. just to, mm-hmm. you know just drop the hammer and just go for help. Yeah, yeah. 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 I just uh, uh, to touch on that, like so. Um, yes, the the intent when they made the film was that they wanted it to be as real and gritty as possible, mm. almost feel like a documentary in the mm. way that it's kind of mm. or how documentaries are shot, um, kind of this kind of fly on the wall kind of approach to things. And that uh, shot you're talking about in particular, all done in one take, where it's all yeah. the crane shot follows her up into the protest. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, is an amazing, amazing. Because uh, oh, that was supposed to be the awesome. film, like effectively the film she's in. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So you're yeah, shooting yeah, the film yeah, within yeah. the film. Within the film. Yeah. Uh, for me, very day for night. And and just just yeah. before you you uh, put your point, um, just because it um, it might be a point of co- uh, conversation around uh, what you were saying too about the horror element of it. Mm. Um, a lot of people that were involved, like uh, freaking uh, Blatty, who wrote this, mm. and Linda Blair, have basically come out and said it's not a horror; it's a theological thriller. Yeah, I can right. see that. Um, yeah. So people have got it wrong when they say yeah. it's a horror, and yet. Uh, m- Normally, this is voted as the number the one, one horror film. In, in, in the top of the list. So I want to ask I why is like that a, the case? Personally, I don't get. I don't get why people yeah. are so. And I've never been afraid of the the film. Yeah, yeah. I don't see yeah. how people are saying this is a really scary film. What is it about this film that makes people so frightened? Yeah, also, yeah. You yeah. need to so, understand Halsey's ghosts for a living. So. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Not for a living. Re- refer to, <laughs> refer to <laughs> a previous podcast. Um, yeah. Yeah, the thing about the film for me, yeah, uh, there was on. a period of films in the late 70s, early 80s, because I was a big scaredy cat, and my parents cared about my psychological well-being and didn't expose me to horror films like your parents did. Uh, but yeah, so, like, <laughs> the, the, you'd always hear about these films that you couldn't see as a kid, like, yeah. this was one, Alien was another one, Rambo was very bloodthirsty. First Blood? It was very th- bloodthirsty, and that was the catchphrase at the time. So, Exorcist was a no-go film, it was something really scary. By the time I saw it, yeah, it was as an adult, and I saw it as an exercise in filmmaking, mm. and I'm thinking, I get why this worked. Yeah. Um, I know from my memories from the 70s is that the paranormal, it was only until recently that what I call the age of scepticism yes. has kicked in into mainstream consciousness. So things like uh, the paranormal was always default considered real. Yeah. God was real. The devil was real. Uh, you look at the murders, of the, the famous um, murders, we talked about this before, the kids who went missing in Australia uh, in the 50s no. and 60s. 
Uh, oh, the, okay, the, no, the, no. the 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 Beaumont children. Oh yeah. One of the first things yeah. the cops did oh, yeah. to find the children was bringing the psychic. Yeah, so yeah. It yeah. was always the fault believed to be the amateur horror, and that came out. Everybody just assumed it was real. Yeah. So yeah, see, that yeah. that scared me. That yeah. that film, yeah. and I saw that you know at quite an early age, and that the horror haunted house type yeah. stuff is fucking yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, um, and, but I, from what mm. I can gather, because I agree, John, apparently it gets voted number one. That's the number. Yeah, one it one does. Film, mm. Every time. What I can gather, the reason why it gets that, it was the first film to bring the horrible outside into your house. Well, yeah, it's that, that's true. Into that is, life. it takes, and in, in particular, a young a girl's child, bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. Into, and into a person. So it's not yeah. like it's your house that's haunted. Yeah, yeah. It's a person yeah. that's haunted. Mm. And that concept was incredibly scary. It's a very sparse film. Yes. But that helps it. 1973, I should just add, is when yeah, this right. got released. Oh, okay. Um, Blatty's book that it's based on was 1971, so mm. it was just a couple of years yeah. in between. And Freakin, uh, what inspired Freakin to um, go ahead and make this movie was that he, um, he read the book and he said he literally just read it in one sitting, over, wow. in like about four hours, blasted wow. through it, and just said it's one of the best pieces of literature that he'd, he'd read. Wow. And... Um, was so inspired by that that he wanted to go and make yeah, it. Get the rights. And he'd crossed paths with Blady before on a, on a project which he which didn't kind of come about. Mm. Um, but it kind of um, it resonated. And you know, you watch these guys on on any of the audio commentary stuff that's there, mm. and they definitely got a connection. You can see that. And I think that really helps yeah, cement sure. what you know the 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 backbone of what this movie is. So, have you read the book? No. Love I'd that. love to, though. Yeah. yeah. Off the back of me watching good. that, I went, I wouldn't mind reading it. Huh? I've, I have heard the book's good. Yeah. Like, mm. I know people who read it, like, years ago and, mm. and before I'd seen it. And I used to see it at friends' places. The parents yeah. were reading the yeah. book. Yeah. And yeah, well. they said it was, it was a great book. Yeah, it's supposed to be. It's supposed yeah. to be. I mean, I haven't even uh, watched the film, so I can't comment. <laughs> hey. oh, wait, wait, wait! <laughs> wait, is it a film? Uh, that's uh, book. No. The uh, yeah, so it's a musical. It's a, yeah. I heard they're making it into a musical. Oh, fucking oh awesome. how funny would that be? <laughs> but no, you pick up first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, me fuck You know what she's <laughs> done? <laughs> Your cunting <laughs> daughter. <laughs> da, 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 da. And curtain. That's in the back one. <laughs> Fucking hell, that'd be so awesome. Oh, yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like it's, uh, you know, so Matt, Matt Stone, it. Trey Parker. Yeah, it's got to be yeah. fucking... Yeah. It's, it's got to be The Exorcist, the musical. <laughs> I love it. That would be amazing. <laughs> they made the Elephant Man into a musical. They made, yeah. They did. Yeah. yeah. They did. Because wow. I remember seeing that in The Tall Guy. The, the send up of the yeah, audience. that's but hilarious. Yeah, it's but they actually did it. I mean, they actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like, um, my my take when I first watched it is that I I didn't find I wasn't scared. I did find it chilling. I thought there was a chilling element yeah, to it when I watched it, and that's what kind of I came out uh, watching it. And I went, and I did see go and see the you know when they the whole remastered, redigitalized release in two thousand. Yeah. Um, I did go and see it. Actually, at the, the cinema, the, I, I, yeah. I was sending out the film prints out to all the cinema. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, I loved it, I, mm. and I, I did. But I like you. I just I, look. I'm a huge fan of Freakin's uh, work. Mm. I mean, we'll talk about his uh, he's style. A freak, he's a freaking fan. <laughs> um, because I was I was more aware of uh, the French Connection before I watched The Exorcist, mm. and I love the French Connection. I think it's such See, a beautiful. I have movie. a story actually. Yeah. I Go was on. Just telling you about it before. Yeah. I had a really horrible boss. I know. Oh no, you saw Neil. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah. Neil. Yeah. Um, uh, when I first started at wherever this place is here. <laughs> Um, they are not mentioning it yes. at all. I I worked under this boss who was absolutely vile. Right. And and my friend, uh, this was in the days of Piemont, and my friend uh, who was my wife's ex flatmate. Yes. She worked for Village Roadshow. Yes. And Warner Brothers, and they brought out Friedkin, and they had a remastered version of uh, the French Connection. Yeah, yeah. They were shown in the, their theaterette. And she said to me, do you want to come along to a screening? Um, it's about 4.30 in the afternoon, so can you get out of work? And yeah. it's around the corner from where you work anyway, so you can just dart over. Yeah, and yeah. Come and do this, watch the screening with uh, uh, William Freakin, and he's going to do a Q&A. Oh, afterwards. far out. I was like, fuck yes, I am there. And I was like on my way out the door, and my boss went, you walk out and you're fired. Oh, my God. And, just, and I said, why? And he goes, 
because oh. I had to stop me going because he was like, see you Looks in the me. next in the Northern Territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and his name was. Beep. But yeah. <laughs> Paul's just written down who is it on his on his notepad. Who is he? He doesn't work at, he doesn't work here anymore. Okay. He got marched out for uh, sexual harassment a long time ago. Oh he yeah. Like a vile, horrible nice. person. Give me that one for the phone. And I've not <laughs> seen him since, but yes. Um, that's See you in, in, oh, in nice. a northern territory. Yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. use a podcast to stab people who fucked you over the yeah. Okay. Well yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, fuck that guy. He wouldn't be listening to this anyway because nah. he's a Dull turd. Oh, yeah, he's dead anyway. Yeah. I killed him. Yeah. yeah. I did put it out. <laughs> so, all right. So, look, maybe uh, maybe this is a good point then. So, we've kind of talked about our kind of early reactions to it. And maybe we'll talk about how we feel the, the movie stands up now um, when we kind of come to close the podcast. But let's talk about uh, the, the players of the piece then. We're, we're talking quite heavily around Freaking at the moment. Mm-hmm. I've already said that I'm a huge fan of... The uh, I want I'm trying to be really delicate. Like I lo- I'm a huge fan of the final product that he produces in in his films. Mm. Um, now obviously he's quite a controversial figure, and if you listen to any of uh, again any of his audio commentaries, he's a very passionate man, and um, and he's a determined man, and he kind of has an eye for something, and he'll just get that result. Yeah, and whatever just he's one of those yeah. old school directors who just punishes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So there's there's a lot of yeah. incidents that came out, particularly in this movie, and there's a lot of extreme kind of stuff. Some of it, um, I'll go to the lesser kind of stuff first, but um, he really wanted to capture all the realistic kind of yeah. element of it. So as I said earlier at the beginning, there's a lot of medical kind of stuff that's shown. There's yeah. an operation uh, done on uh, Linda Blair. Uh, Reagan's character, yes, the MRI, character. yeah, weird. yeah, and there's a the and she has an injection put into her neck, yeah, and a lot of people yeah. um, who've watched this movie when they're told what's the most scariest bit, that's the bit that yeah, they that, say yeah, that yeah, comes exactly. to their head. It's, it's fluid, though, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right, yeah, house, yeah. and they kind of look because and a lot of it was people were throwing up over that kind of right. one incident, and and the thing is, it's not real it's oh, staged yeah. but the guy that's doing it is not an actor he's an actual kind of surgeon who's performing it that's what because I remember that yeah. she's crying and he's doing the, that doctor turn of one more time yeah, yeah. two more seconds it's okay and you yeah. he's not really caring about it he's just yeah, trying yeah. to get her to stand still so he can finish his thing mm. which it. we've all had that as kids with the doctors yeah. injecting us and we're screaming down the house well I did anyway yeah yeah um, and you, you've seen your kid do that yeah. you've got to console them by lying to them saying it'll be over soon and it's real yeah, yeah. it's real yeah, it's you feel it because she's crying yeah. she's in a lot of pain yeah, grounded. Yeah, yeah. So like, so this that that in particular stood out, and there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of like these like scenes. That, I mean, the it's and I think part of why it's haunting too is as Miles said, it's a very kind of or even you said, Ant, sorry, but it's a very kind of slow build up to the you know mm. throughout the film. There's you know lots of elements that are happening throughout it. Yeah. You know, before you get to that stage, and it's the first kind of real in your face. Well, okay, that's. Because, you know, that was um, the thing for me, because I knew the end result, obviously, and I guess mm. looking back now on my first viewing of it, it's like, it all, yeah, when are they getting to the point where they realise she's possessed? Yeah, yeah. And it almost felt like they got there yeah. when everything else didn't work. Yes. And it wasn't almost like that big a shock to them. No. Because I got a sense that they were exhausted at that point. She was, the mother was exhausted in terms of like, what is wrong with that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Some sort of memory, but, um, yeah, Okay. But it's a psychic at the party that notices it, isn't it? Doesn't, did she say, she says, you're yeah. going to die to the psychic or somebody? Oh. What's that? Does she say to the psychic because the psychic is the one that's, that's sussed her out? Well, she, no, well so, so she says it to her mum's friend, boyfriend, boyfriend or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's right, yeah. There's the director. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then and then one of the other party members goes, uh, says something or, yeah. about it and recognises what's, what's, going, what's on going on. Yeah, right. And then we have the, the other priest that's there too. Or does he the, come the original family priest? Yeah. The one that actually is a priest in real life. Oh, is it? And was, oh. and was cast because uh, William Blatty kind of knew him or something. And he okay. kind of said to Freakin, you kind of got to meet this guy because he pretty much is the character that I've based him on. Right, right. And then uh, Freakin kept putting it off, putting it off. And then he, when he went and saw him, he went, yeah, I kind of get it. Yeah, yeah okay. he's, he's him. So, and interestingly, that comes to... Uh, one of Freakin's most extreme measures in this. It wasn't the gunshot one. Mm. So Freakin had a habit of going around on set for this, going around just shooting a gun um, randomly to try and kind of get, fright, get yeah. people get, on that on the edge the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and Jason Miller, who plays Father Karras in this, he got a bit pissed off with that because he was just like, I'm an actor, I don't need to yeah, be. Yeah, I know how to act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Out, you know. And even like he, Jason Miller, actually really begged for the role, kept kind of trying to push for it. And Freakin's like, no, no, we've got people lined up. Um, you know, um, uh, Jack Nicholson, we're thinking of getting Jack Nicholson in to play the role. We need a name, blah, blah, blah. Kept and putting it off. And the guy just goes, look, just, just let me audition for you. Let me just do an audition. And then, um, and all, you know, um, yeah, I just want to read for it because I really feel like this is the part. And as soon as, like, eventually, again, freaking caved down and, and said, all right, I'll see you. And when he did the audition, he kind of went, yeah, I, I completely get it. I mm-hmm. now have to try and convince the producers yeah. in the mm-hmm. studio yeah, that, that you're the that person. And at that point, uh, so Ellen Burstyn, as we said, plays, plays the mother in this. She was, wasn't the original choice either. Um, they went through uh, about people, um, I've got them written down somewhere, and I can't find them off the top of my head, but I know Anne Bancroft was one person. Oh, really? And again, the studio really were pushing, they wanted a name person, they really, really wanted a name person. Well, um, was a name. But Jane, I Jane, F- so, hey, oh no, here we go, Is this, I've got it here. Audrey Hepburn was considered, but only if it were, and she considered it, but only if it was filmed in Rome. The whole thing was filmed in Rome. Ah, <laughs> oh, because it's sort of Vatican. And, and, and Freaking went, uh, I'm not going to go shit in Rome. <laughs> um, this doesn't suit the film at all. So that got turned down. So then Anne Bancroft was meant to be up, but then she uh, was in her first month of pregnancy at the time, so actually oh. turned it down to, or couldn't commit. And then Jane F- F- Fonda was offered, and she turned it down flat. So during this process, Ellen Burstyn's name was there, and, and Freaking actually kind of. Well, she's quite bigger. She just done um, what the Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, Blue Scorsese. So that would have been yeah. Quite, and again, like a, again, uh, epic film. Burstyn was also wanting to really play the role. She yeah. was, and, uh, she's and then, Burstyn to play the role. Burstyn played the role, and Freaking actually in this instance was actually a campaigner for her, wanted to, to do something mm. uh, to push this. Sorry, I got distracted with really. you. Go on. <laughs> sorry. So I'm just saying the side story that reminded me of that was um, Simon Pegg when he got his first series up space. Yes. He goes to Edgar Wright, going, you need to meet my mate, he's going to be funny. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah and that's apparently right. Edgar Wright was like, okay, and then again, put it off because like everybody yeah. has a mate, you should meet my mate, he's really funny. And that mate was Nick Frost. <laughs> and yeah, he's yeah. a plumber or something. He's a plumber, he? Yeah, he's a plumber at that point. He just, he used yeah. to, apparently they used to hang out at like dead end jobs and during lunch breaks, he Nick Frost would make Simon Pegg laugh. And do the griller or and do, something. Yeah, do yeah. the griller thing, do just, yeah, well, his big character was pretending to be a gun nut. And he yeah. Just oh, that's guns. right. So he didn't mind. So if you look at the first episode of Space, Nick Frost doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Because Simon Craig was trying to, so yeah, Igor Wright was trying to write him out of the show until they finally gave him a go. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, he's actually kind of funny. Oh, yeah. How yeah. 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 funny is that? Red and stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But yeah, that's the same thing. It's, yeah, my mate's a good actor. You should meet him. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll get right on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the other thing was, uh, so just going back to the uh, the stuff with the, it was, um, I'm, I'm just looked it up father william o'malley um was the guy that played uh, father dyer um so there's a, this the scene at the end with the steps um yeah. so father yeah. Karras has uh let Spoiler. the devil consume him and uh taking that moment to throw himself out the window and then down the steps and he's dying mm. and uh yeah. there was like a lot of takes taken it was like really early hours of the morning and they just couldn't get it right yeah. um and it's just a bit where father dyer is leaning over giving him the last rites mm. And um, and William Friedkin's like he's your friend, you know, he's he's mm. dead. You need to be like that. Like. And it just wasn't like from Friedkin's point of view, wasn't getting it. So he just went up and just slapped him massively around the face and went action. Mm. And that's the shot that's in the film mm. where he's actually and physically shaking. shaking yeah. Um, when he's doing the rides. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and he, yeah. you know, and he, so he pushed him to ex- you know actors to the extremes within the movie. Another instance is um, Ellen Burst happened to Ellen Burstyn. And uh, and that's when um, it's the point where she uh, is trying to confront Regan while she's possessed, and the whole kind of crucifix uh, si- uh, yeah. scene is happening. And she, uh, the, the actress who was playing Regan at the time, was wasn't actually Linda Blair. It was shot it's behind stunt double, her, yeah. stunt double, slaps her around the face, and then we were supposed to see a shot of Ellen Burstyn kind of falling down to the ground. Mm. And they kept doing it take after take, and it's just like, it's not working. And then he said, just push it a bit more to the stuntman who was doing it. Um, and he did it, and then Ellen Wilson says, okay, I can't, like, we can't go any further than that. That's actually starting to really hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and, he, and she goes, you need to just kind of tone it down. And he goes, okay, all right, we'll do one more, but I promise we won't, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it down. And then he turns to the stuntman and goes, give her hell. Mm-hmm. And that's 
what the guy kind of went, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I'm being paid, and he does. And what you and that's the shot that you see in the film again. And if you see it, Ellen Burstyn straight away goes for a back because she's really, she really hurt her so back, good. and she goes to the hospital wow. <laughs> after it uh, to get it checked out. And she's like, it's on the audio commentary, you know, yeah. uh, not the audio commentary on the uh, some of the doco stuff that's on the uh, on the DVD if you ever get it. Mm, or, or look at it. Um, but yeah, very interesting stuff. So, like, my question though, as I said, that's come up before, right? is 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 there ever, ever for the na- sake of uh, art and the craft, is mm. there such a thing as going Too beyond? Far. So I, mean, I want to raise that. It question. seems to be very big with those auteur directors at that time. Yeah, yeah. like the classic one being um, Pokoff now, um, so and so getting hammered and throwing yeah. his fist through a mirror. Yeah. Uh, it's I almost a bad job. Lucci and Fellini yeah. used to do as well. It's almost a bad job. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of yeah. young filmmakers go, oh, that's what i got to do. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's necessary to tell you the truth. I think you can, yeah. you can work alongside an actor. And some of the, I think it, that was what it was in the day. Mm. Same as like, because we work in TV, back in the, the 70s and the 80s in TV, people were cunts to each other and mm. people were, you know, vicious to, to their employees and their mm. their. Their staff. Mm. It just doesn't happen anymore. People are a lot nicer to each other. It's a PC universe now. Yeah. And libel uh, universe too. Mm. Like PC. I think people realise that you can actually attract a lot more flies with honey than you can through yeah. just being a cock, basically. Well, I mean, is it, is it lack of, again, people more li- aware of liability as well? And the fact yeah. that, that, that anything you do instantly gets out because everybody carries a portable TV studio mm. or a radio studio. But and, personally, and it, like directing actors, which I've, uh, we've, we've done, is is would you would you go to the, those extremes to get a performance out of someone? Or would you much prefer to, to work with the actor? Because I think... Part of being a director is 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 working mm. with, with the, the actor. actor. Yeah, I, I used to I used to think my philosophy was always if you don't get what you want, that's a failing on the director's behalf. Yeah. Um, and I used to think, yeah, I've got to, if I'm not getting it, there's something that I'm doing. I'm now more relaxed about that and mm. more wherever it is this journey we're taking together as an actor and director, let's find mm. out where we get where we, where we can go. So um, yeah, no, for me, yeah, to me, yeah, I, I get what you're saying because it's. We work so hard to be in the position we're in because it's a position mm. of privilege in that everybody loves to work in television and film. Mm. We are making a living out of it. Uh, if it's not fun, then what's the fucking point? Exactly. Yeah, and so my but at the end of the day, that's the thing that drives me forward because at a certain point, when it does get to that thing of take 100, I'm going to hit this person, I'm, everybody's yeah. exhausted. And we've all I been know, in those, yeah, those yeah, moments. Yeah, totally, yeah. And, you know, you're always... Pro- uh, the problem is you're always across from the person who is probably the loveliest person in the world yeah. and you don't want to be a cunt to them. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't. You know. it, it, it's, it's, it's a, for me, though, it's also that one-on-one thing of, of, of uh, what pushes their buttons better. Some, some, mm. <laughs> some love it when you hit them. No, that, but, uh, but there's some need that, that, that rocket up mm. their butt um, and others need to be loved, otherwise they're not going to mm. give you. So for me, first and foremost, as a director, that, that whole thing of a director should be a psychologist and figure out what makes that actor tick. Yeah. That tends to be my first route in, if I can. I, I think psychological that, effect yeah. has a lot more... Yeah. yeah. But if, you, if you're somebody... Because I know you with the, act, the kind of actor who just works on perfection. Yeah. And they won't... And they will stop at the end of halfway through a take because they didn't get, they think they didn't mm. get it, but you think they did. And that's mm. frustrating, but you get that that's how they operate. And I, an actor yeah. stops halfway through a take. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. not professional. No. You're yeah. supposed to go until <laughs> it's going. finished and but then yeah. go, yeah. by the way, I, mean, I, can, like, do I can do yeah. another one. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've, worked yeah. with act- I've never worked with an actor that stopped halfway through a take. I'm guessing talking more presenter point of view, actually, actually, presenters during links will stop. Yeah, present- oh, yeah. 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 Presenters yeah. are rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they're not really, you know, they're not really actors. But you do get actors who want to go through your script and get it inflection perfect. Yeah, of course. And others who will never do that. And, yeah, and everything in between. And so, but the, like yeah. most of the actors that I've worked with, always want to be better, the, the, give their best performance, and mm. give their, and so they're quite willing to to go to an extreme length mm. to give that mm. best performance. Yeah. Um, just, I think I found that most of the actors I've always worked with are a lot harder than on themselves than I am on them. Yeah. So and mm. which is great and it works for me. So yeah. and then I just give them you know prod them in the right direction and it seems to work out. So. Yeah. I don't think you know, and it, it you know, it, it obviously works works for freaking. And well, that's again, but, that's that, that you know, the ego driven auteur who you and I work with that sort of person. We do call them a wanker. Yeah, um, who don't have any concept of 
time that they chew through and all the stress that they, they cause. Uh, yeah, and do you want to be that sort of do you want to be that sort of filmmaker? What, regardless of the result, there's that thing of, of, of you know the the less intelligent per- person will resort to fist to cuffs rather than yeah, yeah, um, yeah. talking something through. Mm. So it's almost like you know, mm. are you a? I, I almost consider these people a lesser director. Yeah, if they lose their shit. If, if they lose their shit yeah, on yeah. to people. Um, yeah, for me, for me, it's always about the hosting. You host, you host a film shoot. You don't necessarily just direct it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, yeah, it's all about ideally is about the journey you take together to, exactly, see, to see where exactly. you end up. Um, it, it's like anything else. You might in any particular script or, or short film you make, there's usually one line or scene that you want to be letter perfect in your head because that's important to you for whatever reason. Mm. And sometimes I'll probably get a bit more OCD about it, but I like to think I, I did the prep beforehand mm. and make sure that actor <coughs> definitely gets it. Yeah. But at the same time, I tend to. When I hit a wall, from that point of view, I tend to go, okay, you know what, let's see where he takes me, and mm. from there, because I don't know sometimes. Yeah. Mm. And so what you get is usually much more interesting. Um, but yeah, look, yeah, you're, I mean, you're, you're right. If you're going to be that dickhead director who screams and yells and, and yells and don't be fun with everybody. Yeah. Because they're so ego-driven. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. They yeah. want to be the most important person in the room, yeah. and, and that's pretty much it. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's purely an ego thing. It is. And you don't, again, if they make great art, is it, is it worth it? <laughs> that to me well that's what my, that, I guess yeah. that's my question yeah. like because yeah. that's what I struggle with with this movie because um, with all the stuff you hear about it I kind of find that I find myself at pains um, to kind of go I actually really do like this movie mm. like the outcome or, and the final product that we see I think is 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 brilliant like the yeah. st- and it's uh, and that's why I still rate this as one one of the best movies I've seen mm. purely on on what I'm seeing as the end product. Mm. But do you think um, another act director could have gotten the same result? Or no, I don't. That's the no, thing. No, okay. I don't think they would have done it because but in a, if he'd done it in a, on a, under a different method, perhaps I mm. think he probably would have. Yeah, yeah. Gotten, achieved just as much if if he'd had the sensibility to do it a bit more softly. Yeah, and you know, and uh, I mean, I like the idea of firing a gun to keep people on on toes, mm. and I like certain methods that, yeah, yeah. that he uses. But when it's an all out sort of psychological. Or physical abuse on someone. It's just that's not. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But yeah, so like you know, like I, I, I always feel that he probably could have gotten some uh, better, uh, even right. better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if he hadn't re- resorted to that. So I mean, Paul, you're an actor, so. No, yeah, that's yeah. that's what I was going to say. Because, and but then I I come from uh, the Mike Lee school of acting, so I really like the idea of just kind of really building up a character. Collaboration. Yeah, yeah right. that's right. Mm. And so when I... I'm mean, using me uh, use that in a directing method yeah. with, Chad, with Chad, Chad, yeah, um, where I was getting him to do basically the same scene over and over and over and, and over, time, yeah. and just kind of adding an element each time, like, you go, all right, now, now you know that this has just happened in your life. Do it again. And literally it was just, you're getting up, mm. up out of bed and getting ready to go to work. Mm-hmm. And I would just kept adding another layer of, of, of background to his character mm-hmm. and said, now you know that you've done this. How do you blah, blah, blah. And I, I don't know, I generally don't know what Chad's thoughts were of that, but that's what I was trying to, mm-hmm. you know, look at. And so when it comes to something like this, that's probably, like, my my thoughts are that I wouldn't be doing it while the camera was rolling. I would have done all this stuff way, way back. You research. Too. Because so you once the camera is rolling, the person should have the character. Oh, yeah. Like you, because mm. otherwise you're wasting, you're, yeah. you're wasting role, you know, like, oh, yeah. in the, those days when you're, you're facing film. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is too, the sorry. Even, even, sorry, even with the Hollywood system, a lot of times actors just don't have time to prep. No, yeah, yeah, they don't yeah, rehearse. Yeah, yeah. There's a prevalent. whole yeah. bunch of directors who do not rehearse yeah. with their, their yeah. actors. Yeah, it's very prevalent. See, I would, yeah. you know, I'm of the school, uh, and, and you are as well, as, as you rehearse beforehand mm. I mean I didn't do that with Danger Danger <laughs> because I didn't have the time different. and it, no, it, 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 it was a different I know it, come, it, it, it does come down to the generated yeah. thing yeah. Yeah. so but yeah. if you you know in a character generated thing you, you fucking rehearse it yeah so. that's right and I'm very much that mm. that way yeah, like yeah. I love building up a character to kind of really you know you know. so by the time the idea by the time the camera's rolling that you're basically yeah, like yeah. the director can just go all right, now I need you to do this. Mm-hmm. And the director knows that they don't have to then school the, the actor in doing it a certain Why way. Doing yeah. Yeah. You're doing it in, in the way that the director's trying to go, right, well, I want this shot, so I need you to just do what you did, blah, 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 but I'm now really coming from here. Or, mm-hmm. or can you just, you know, change the tone? Or, yeah. you know, just give it's those little yeah. inflections, and that's the director's choice to then try and yeah. 
to Jeez. squeeze that last little bit out. Yeah. Or, you know. So, so, bringing it back to the movie. Yeah. Why don't you want to think about Linda, Linda Blair, and her performance and how? Yeah. So this her. is interesting too, isn't yeah. it? Because um, you know she was she was a kid. There's a lot of uh, when the movie came out, there was a lot of concern about her and everything yeah, that she'd welfare. gone through. Yeah. And how old was she when she did this? Man, I knew you were going to ask me that. I wanted to say she was in her teens, and um, I can look well, it up when I'm. I think I was thirteen or something. I was going to say right, right. thirteen was coming to my Yeah, age. it was just what. on that tweeny yeah. stage. And so there was a lot of kind of uh, question marks about. Um, she may have done this. It's a bit like Jenny Foster, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, they're quite into it, they're, they're young girls she's fucking around with those not. young girls. Back then, wasn't, back then, wasn't, wasn't it? fucking Lucas the original draft of Indiana Jones? Indiana Jones had an affair with Marion when Marion was 11. Yeah, so she was 13. Oh, right. she was that was 13. the original draft. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, so that was, yeah, it was popular. Yeah, was I mean, she was, was, I mean, it's insinuated there. Yeah. What's um, that? In, uh, in Raised Lost. In Raised Lost, that she yeah, was very young. Yeah. She said, yeah, I was a child. Yeah. You knew what you were doing. But the implication for me at the time was just saying, Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the original draft, they specified that she was 11. So it was like, right. what the fuck? Yeah. Well, she was that. So she's 13. She was 13. 13 this year. Yeah. So, so, um, so there's a lot of stuff. But then, like, she said, like, she she was saying, um, I think I can't have the maths right there. So she was born in 1959. Yes. Anyway, so. Um, oh. So she was, um, what was I going to say to that? So, but she's gone on to kind of quote um, saying um, things like, um, you know, a child doesn't know what those words mean when she was, you know, being told to do stuff. Yeah. Like, and then the, I guess the big thing is the crucifix mas- masturbation mm, scene, yeah. um, which is the probably the most controversial scene that's shot. It's in the book too, yeah. and they did kind of, you know, they talked about how. Uh, you know, Blatty talked about he needed a tipping point for the mum yeah. to kind of really, thing. yeah, to kind of really realise that this isn't, like, this you is know, medical. this isn't considered medical. This yeah. is something beyond that. This is something that she needs to be shocked by. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it needed to be something that in your face. And so that's what he kind of came up with um, as a concept. You know what? So I think like, I've, read, I've read, there's not the book, that part of the book, so it's coming back to me now. Yeah. Because the book was much more that description of what happens at the scene. When I finally saw the movie, I was a bit disappointed. Because nah. it's so graphic oh. in the book. Right. And how it goes. But with the movie, she's stabbing, it's, it was a box in the end. It was a box with a panting over it, apparently. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah there, there's so, shot, you yeah. can see in like behind the yeah. scenes shots and stuff. Saying, yeah, there's yeah, like a of, kind of cushion thing yeah. that she's hitting. Yeah, she, and she so, found it and it's blood soaked yeah, as well. It's as blood soaked. You know. So it's a bit of a giggle, I think. She yeah. Said, yeah. Not, she's quoted saying, I thought it was funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she had no, yeah, no concept. And even the word, like, the swearing and stuff yeah, she's yeah. saying in it. Yeah. And actually, you can hear uh, the actual audio of her saying the stuff. Like, yeah, it right. exists. Yeah, right. um, so you can kind of watch this stuff online. Yeah. And it really doesn't sound right, you know. Yeah, right. As in, not in the sense that it doesn't sound... I don't mean it doesn't sound right because it's a girl talking. But, like, in the context of how we've seen the film and, that you know, got the voiceover used within it, then... Um, it just sounds odd when you then hear a child's voice saying that, you know, kind of stuff. So yeah. I get, I get why there would be have been concern around it. Mm. Um, I've written down the lady's name that uh, actually did the voice. I think it was Mercedes Cambridge, no. um, but I'm going to look that up just to make sure I'm correct while we're talking. Um, but she, um, she was the one. Yeah, Mercedes M- McCambridge. Sorry, Mercedes McCambridge. So she was the one that actually provided the voice of the demon. Right. And uh, she was she was somebody that like so what William Friedkin wanted he wanted a voice uh, somebody who had a voice who was not masculine or feminine. Right. Um, he wanted something kind of very like you listen to it it could fall either way. Yeah. And it suddenly just struck him of this kind of uh, radio um, kind of um, voice artist that he knew of a while ago, mm-hmm. and uh, he got them to kind of look up what she's doing and he found out that she was still acting and stuff got you know doing voice work and stuff got her in kind of to talk through it all and when they kind of she was very, definitely very method in producing the voice too like she right. basically started chain smoking right. and uh, having uh, drinking like bo- uh, raw, raw eggs and, wow. and drinking whiskey like shots of whiskey to really produce that voice yeah. that we hear at the yeah. end of it and it's uh it's part of what make, makes that kind of uh, a believable moment is Ooh. is the voice that's produced in it is is pretty uh, pretty. Yeah. Well on. You don't realize so. how many seminal things came out of that film that's been reproduced in comedy and yeah, other yeah, films. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the the talking backwards scene is a big one. Yeah. Um, the, the 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 twisting of the head, the yes. possessed deep voice, 
the vomit. Yeah. Um, even uh, the power of Christ compels you is a line that's used in fucking so many films. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, there's so many things I need to touch base on all of these things you just <laughs> yeah. said. Because um, go, just going from the first one that I can remember you saying, which was at the end, about the, the power of Christ compels you, mm. and the repetition of that that's used in the exorcist bit at the end. So uh, people have asked him why he uses that and why they repeat it, you know, that it was produced and stuff, were asking him why, why are you getting them to repeat the same thing over and over and over. So he'd actually been sent actual audio from mm. an actual exorcism from the Vatican City. Mm. Um, and he said within that, that they were repeating that. And he asked them, why were they doing that? And he just said, at the time in that exorcism, it was what was working. So they kept repeating it mm. to kind of you know, uh, get the uh, the demon to kind of withdraw. Mm. Um, and some of the uh, sounds that you hear within the film The Exorcist are actual sound bites from those tapes wow. of a boy that was um, apparently going through an exorcism and all this kind of... So some of the stuff you ha- hear is actually wow. taken from a <laughs> genuine exorcism. Um, which yeah kind of makes it even more that's what I'm saying the more you learn about this film the more impressive it becomes the stuff that they were doing to to put this stuff together Um, you know and and a lot of the makeup stuff so Dick Smith we mentioned before you know he did about it was about the sick uh, outcome of getting her to Regan to to look the way she does that we see her in the film when she's uh, at the very extent of the possession Mm. Um, and you can see again like lots of like um, shots of this online by looking it up. The final one, it just kind of, you know, Freak and kind of takes ownership on the direction of it, which he's a director, so he, he's allowed to do that. Um, but he kind of just said, like, he kind of just thought it really just needs to be really simple. Like, it's it's almost like she's getting sicker and sicker. Mm. And and so Dick Smith took that on and thought what that looked like and basically pared everything back down again. Mm. And then you get that kind of, like, all the scars and stuff and lacerations that you yeah. kind of see on her face. And, mm. and, and that's the final product and it you know it looks realistic and like yeah. the you've yeah. massively hats and that's what i'm saying a lot of the stuff or like furniture moving was all done um like with like slots and things yeah, underneath the floor yeah. and mm. pulling you know pulling the, the cupboards along yeah. and you know like using old school theater techniques yeah. essentially to pull off but they work the believability of it yeah yeah it really works and the neck head turning thing mm. Um, that the whole of that is a puppet essentially, mm. and so you see uh, with the neck turning, it's it's just a swivel. Mm. But they made it so lifelike, the, the actual mm. uh, face so lifelike um, that they actually thought like, and they were worried about because you'd see the slit yeah. in the neck. Right. And but the way the head turns, the hair covers right. uh, covers it naturally, and so they knew they could get away with it. But they said, does this thing look realistic enough? And they basically took it into a, a New York cab out on the street <laughs> and as it was going along they stopped turned it around looked at the passers by and then did the head neck turn and people were like going oh. <laughs> and, it just like, and they knew then that it was it was going to work and yeah, that's yeah. what they used as the final product but yeah freaking amazing stuff a lot of the I always thought about the head the, the head neck turn thing if you possess a body and you swirl its head 180 degrees you snap the neck of the person yeah, you're dead. in you, yeah. you can't get back you break the, the body's neck yeah. you can't physically do that how does that work Sorry, just gonna say. <laughs> no, no, it's totally it's, it's, it's logical. It, it is, it's yeah. logical, and I think that's the thing. It's it, it defies logic. What's yeah. happening? A lot of stuff defies logic, and so yeah, to, you're right. I've often thought the same thing. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Yeah, it doesn't um, Can we talk about the Spider Walk? Yeah, well, yeah. So there's there's two versions of the movie that kind yes. of came out. One, and then you get the director's cut, and one of them is the spy the Spider Walk scene. Yeah. Um, so just before I get to the actual spider walk bit, so just before that, we hear the news of the uh, director that's been killed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, um, just one, he's going to come in. Um, so he, uh, the director's been killed. So the, there's another actor or, or crew member that turns up and tells the news, and it's a shock moment because we're here. Mm. He died. He was he's found dead. As we and you have Ellen first to react to that yeah. and then all of a sudden we get the, the, the spider walk yeah. scene where yeah. Regan comes down backwards down, down the, the stairs, stairs. Mm. her head down pointing down and she's, yeah, she's, yeah, she's, she's upside down, down. Like, she's dancing as a crab I call it a yeah, crab yeah, crab mm. walk, yeah, crab yeah. Walk, yeah. down the stairs and then li- uh, there's a kind of tongue flicker kind of thing and, and then, then she blood goes pulls to, out of her mouth or something yeah, yeah yeah and then she goes to attack the kind of nanny person that's, that's their mm. character 
Um, so this didn't, that bit didn't kind of make the final yeah. cut. It was used the first cut. Yeah, the, later on. So why did they not release that? Was that too much? Or I think the effects didn't, wasn't, didn't was it? look Yeah, like it didn't kind of marry up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, one of the, uh, but what was interesting is, and they discussed, William Blady and uh, Freakin discussed this in the, in the uh, one of the documentaries that are used within it, and then uh, in the DVD release, that they, um, the problem with it was, was it was a double hitter. So you have a reaction to the death, and then oh, the reaction to that. that happening, and that didn't work because it was two shock moments. shock moments, and they couldn't quite get that to work properly. And, uh, and, you know, Blady actually said, um, yeah, I probably, in hindsight, would have rewritten it. Right. He said, I take, I take ownership on the reason why that didn't work. As a writer, mm. I would have tried it a different way to in order to get that kind of reaction. Because my, my first viewing had that in it, because that was the really yeah. anniversary release. And I thought, shit, that really works. Yeah, and yeah. I can't believe they, they dropped it. But uh, that reminds me of the, the Jaws thing, uh, Spielberg's, when the fish... The fish? Shark first comes out of the water and the classic you need a bigger boat line when the first viewing of that the crowd lost their shit yeah. and there was literally a popcorn flying in the hair moment which as a director that's no, no better compliment than that yeah 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 you live to make films for that but then he thought I'd get another scare which is the next version of that had the, the, the Ben Garner character yeah he said hey. clutch out of the boat, yeah, yeah, boat. Yeah, yeah. and because he inserted that everybody was on edge up to that shark moment so when that shark moment happens people weren't as scared because yeah. they were waiting for it to come mm. so it's an interesting thing about pacing yeah yeah particularly horror films where you're going to put your scares as we talked with James Wan when he, when he did that when he came in the good top on that film yeah was, yeah yeah he took out all the scares and then why are you taking out the scares because, well that's not what makes it really scary it's everything in between you yeah yeah so, that's interesting. I was talking to um, uh, this is a big name drop and I really have to apologise but I was talking to Eduardo Sanchez the director of mm-hmm. uh, Blair Witch Project which I'm going to be releasing um, as a podcast um, and the reason I, I'm mentioning him because we were talking about It Follows, the movie It Follows. Mm. And he said, if you actually watch it, there's only actually one scare moment. And it's right at the very beginning mm. where a ball gets thrown against a window or, or something. Mm. He said, everything after that, there's no scare moment right. in it. Yeah, and it's all suspense. Yeah. yeah. The, the rest of the movie. Right. And he said, that's part of. And, you know, when people have asked, they asked um, the director of White, why that's the case and he said well I want I want people always want that kind of jump scare moment if I've got it already at the beginning and out of the way mm. the rest of the time they're waiting and waiting for that next one that's true yeah um, and so they're just on tender hooks for the rest mm. of the movie just waiting for it and admittedly the ending of that movie kind of pitters out a little bit but mm. yeah. um, you know but generally like yeah, that, I thought that was quite an interesting mm. way yeah. Of, yeah, yeah going about it cool um so yeah, so so I guess like, what do we think then? Like, so was freaking on the right kind of wavelength and, do, and what he produced? Did, what do we? What was our outcome on that? That I mean, I've said that I think. Because you think it wasn't worth it. No, I think it kind of was. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I think when you look at it, it, it looks good. But yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, don't I don't see the world in that. You don't. In that way, I think no. it's, that's your methodology, and that was the thing that you made. Yeah, and that's yeah. the interesting footnote in the history of film. But let's see what else somebody else can do. Um, you can choose. Yeah, look, you know, it's a personal opinion. You'll come away thinking, well, I've worked for that guy, he's a fucking wanker. <laughs> yeah. um, but, end of the day, that doesn't affect me at all. I mean, mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't think it's a golden rule, this is how you make, this is the ultimate way to make films one way or the other. You choose how you want to be a storyteller and you choose the method you want to to make stories and you choose the people around you that will execute yeah. your methodology. So, um, let's yeah. um, let's uh, let's talk about, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if you wanted to Cut him and say no, something no, no, else. Fine, but let's uh, let's talk about um, the, you know the very beginning of the movie. It's all shot in Iraq. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all the excavation thing that's happening. There was an actual excavation happening, and that's what, where they were filming on that site mm-hmm. to kind of capture that whole kind of moment as it unfolds. My first memory of watching the film is I felt that really dragged that whole opening. But was that, I, I, I got confused a bit when I first yeah. saw it as a kid as what the hell is going on. Yeah, they find it. A booby idol yeah. <laughs> in the ground. It's a booby. And I was like, how the hell does a booby idol affect this actress and a kid all the way in New York? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's because that, 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 they released a demon, didn't they? So I still don't know today what exactly what it is, but they released it's, a demon. No, yeah, it's a demon, of, and I've written it somewhere Beelzebub, not Beelzebub, but somebody like that. Jeff? Jeff. Oh, I'm Jeff. Oh, no, yeah. I'm going to really scare you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, oh, I can't find it. It begins with a B. 
Um, Bob. Bob. Um, um, but yeah, the uh, no, it's not that they re- it's not that they release him. It's like there's there's uh, the whole thing is is the battle between good and evil that's happening within the whole kind of story arc. Yeah. Um, and so this where they are at, it's almost like it's uh, it's this energy, and 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 they actually celebrate the demon too. So there's all these kind of artifacts and stuff that they're kind of discovering in the archaeological dig. At the same time, they also find that um, that St. Uh, St. Joseph's medal mm-hmm. um, uh, in that dig too. Yeah. It's when they're in the scene where like he's kind of surveying over the bits and pieces, mm-hmm. and it's both uh, both things seem out of place for what was the grand kind of scheme of unearthing in the archaeological dig. They're both things that you wouldn't expect to see in there. Mm-hmm. St. Joseph's medal and this kind of figure of this demon, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why, um, and it's also like, you know, Father Merrin almost gets a premonition of something's going to be unleashed into the world. Right. And that's where you get all the dogs kind of start attacking each other and there's all this kind of weird moment. And then there's that beautiful shot where he comes up and he's like face to face with the bigger kind of yeah, demon yeah. figure. So you've got the yeah. evil on one side and good on the other. Good on the other. Mm. Um, what's, why I mention the medal too is because when it comes to later on, it, the medal is what uh, Father Karras wears around his neck. Right. And so he's the kind of symbol of light and hope yeah. that's going to try and conquer um, far, you know, the, the demon, um, or in this case the devil himself. Um, and so there's this kind of like constant kind of uh, mirror of, of stuff that's happening throughout the movie. Um, the other thing as well is like, just as a bit of a sideline, is like, uh, you know, so Father Merrin, uh, uh, um, Max von Sydow's character, he's, um, I got confused about him popping the pills when I first watched it. Right. So I didn't understand that that was to control his heart. Yeah, he'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I thought he was addicted to drugs when I first watched it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's an interesting take. And I was young. So I was young when I first watched it in my defence. Um, but, it, I, you know, when you kind of watch it now and then he, just before, you know, he's about to face... He's, so he's been building up. He's been building up to this moment where he knows he's going to be facing this demon. Um, and he has to go into the bathroom at the very... Just before the very end, he goes into the bathroom and he has to try and control it. And he knows... He already knows he's having a, a heart That's attack right. at that moment, right. but he knows that he still has to carry out this procedure. And it's mm-hmm. kind of what I, again, why I really love love the story. From, from memory, doesn't like, he tell the young the young guy to take a break? Yeah, he takes a break because he goes. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah. Father Karras, he starts having visions. So something we didn't talk about. There's a bit of a backstory of Father Karras. His character, mother, Karras mother yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. His mother has passed away. So Cox and so That's another classic line of people. Yeah. yeah. Or as my friend, my actor friend used to say, my, uh, your mother so socks in hole. <laughs> Which I absolutely love. Um, <laughs> Ooh, that's horrible. What the fuck did you just say? <laughs> your mother so socks in hole. <laughs> yeah, massive hat socks. Yeah, it was always, always going to be a good laugh. So, um, yeah, look, he, uh, but you're right, that's another classic line that's in there. But, like, so he's constantly facing his own demons anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what the, the devil plays on, you know, and it even kind of, you know, uses his mother's voice right. to kind of. And so yeah. just before uh, and it's so used he's sent out, he has a vision of his mother on the bed. That's right. Yeah. And he starts having nightmares before, too, of yeah. his mum and the subway system and that's crawling right, yeah. across and that really kind of yeah. distorted stuff. So it's, to me, that was already a sign of, of the devil playing with him before yeah. he's even kind of fully, in, you know, trying to take it off. So to me, the story is interesting because there's two priests and you kind of feel like the exorcist that comes along, the guy that's trained to do it, he's already weak. And yeah. so it's an easy target for the devil to kind of just win that battle. But... Supposedly, he's the expert and he's the one that should defeat it. And so it's almost like when uh, Father Karras is told to leave and he has that kind of time out and he has that epiphany moment when he's talking to the mother where she kind of says to him, is, is my daughter going to die? And he's like, he's like, well, no, I'm not going to let that happen. And that's what gets him to go back up into the room to take it on. He's like, no, that's what he needed to hear. Because mm. this is not just about right. his thoughts and his... You know what he's trying to do. This comes down to there's a 13 year old girl that's possessed. So then, when he but obviously when he goes in, he's confronted with the fact that Father Merrin's dead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and like you know, so what did he do? And then and there's a quite a brutal scene there. Where he a... beats. He's beaten his girl yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's not Linda Blair again. It's the, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's understandable, but yeah. from a viewer's perspective, he's physically beaten this woman. Well, it's interesting strategically okay. though, from the, the devil's point of view. What the hell is he going? Did he thought he pushed? He was going to push him. Obviously, that's going to break. He's killed Marin. That's going to push the young guy. Did the demon the devil think? Oh, I didn't expect him to actually start wailing on me. And yeah, go, it's and interesting. Because he, in he says, "Coming to me, choose me." What doesn't, and that's what he does. He yeah, far for happy, his face goes all. That's right. Crazy. Yeah, and then he tosses himself out the window. Yeah. Um, so the demon did kind of lose that point of view. Like, oh no, he definitely he lost. Yeah. But like, it was a point where, like, if if they didn't do something, she was going to die. So yeah. they actually test her for uh, her life sign, and they can see it fading at that yeah. point. So they know it's quite a crucial mm. point to kind of keep her alive. So. You know, he knows at that point, he's got no, like, he's even got, like, he's even lost the will anyway. He's lost, he's lost, the, he's lost faith at this point. So he's kind yeah, right. of losing that. And so, like, in his mind, the only thing he can do is save this young girl's life. Right. And so he's willing for the devil to take him. And then there's a, you know, there's a battle there that, as you say, you get that glimmer of uh, the demon on, on his face mm. um, before he... He's able to still take control and throw himself out the window, thus killing himself, and the mm. demon's got nowhere to go. Which, as a Catholic so, priest, that's a big sin, isn't it? Yeah, but then he yeah, gets he get. That's why it's final important right to have the final right rights at the very end. Uh, yeah. But he did it for the right. Because if you see, so. he's still alive too. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he, and he's yeah, just yeah, about yeah, talking, yeah. and that's when he's given the final right. I, so. I do remember too the beauty the beauty as well of this sort of film is the bedroom in the sense that you dread. Going up there. Mm. Mm. I, mean, I remember David Allen. Remember David Allen, the Irish comedian? Yeah. Mm. I used to love him. He's a storyteller. Yeah. Mm. And he used to tell, the big part of his comedy was that he used to tell horror stories. Yeah. And then give it a comedy ending. And, and he wrote, he did one which was basically The Exorcist about a girl. He got a diary sent to him from a woman from Ireland yeah. about her daughter. And, um, and, 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 the, and he just reads it. He reads it and it's about the journey of the daughter. She grows up. She's the loveliest girl. And just hit puberty. She tends to back chatting now and then. And yeah. everything she does just progressively gets more aggressive. And then, then as he goes into the, into the chain of the pages, telling the story, it just gets darker and darker. Everything she does is, is strange and terrifying. And then the mother, the final entry, reads the final entry, I know who this woman is. And every time, every night I go to my bedroom, I try to who it is, I hear it coming into my bedroom now. And it's just, it's just as a kid. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And the big thing is, I know who this person is, that it's, it turns the page and there's nothing. But he's he's so good at doing that. But that again, mm. that imagery of because I remember watching the film and being absolutely terrified every time they had to go back into that room. Mm. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. I there's one bit where the the nanny yes. calls in Father Karras and says you need to see something. And yes, it's just fucking chilling. Like, oh, with it and because 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 yeah. Regan's already mm. just going to put them through hell. Yeah, and you, it's it's at the, it's at the middle of the night and she's yeah. got a lamp. And she shows him to help me. Yeah, this is quite the chest yeah, yeah. from inside. Yeah, really, really. Why would you fucking go in there? If I know. You know it's Such just... a. I mean, that's what like. There's so many be- like great moments in that. Like mm. the makeup. Like, you've got to take your hats off to the crew that made mm. this film because mm. they were really pushing it to the limit of trying to make this as believable as possible. Mm. And it looks great. Some of the stuff. And oh, you yeah. you got to imagine like it's so hard for a younger audience, I think, to understand. The, the extent nothing at that point had been seen yeah. no yeah, no yeah, that's yeah, right yeah. and like because like modern day audiences are used to seeing that stuff just done what computer generated yeah where you know even like okay so you were talking about the room and they actually had to make it a, a massive a refrigerator room. essentially yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and so they had four um, air conditioning units yeah. and because uh, the room would quickly heat up yeah. They left them on overnight, yeah. and so when they went in early do- early in the morning, they had like a twenty minute window to kind of to get as much around. as they could because they wanted to physically see the yeah, breath, breath. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. in there. So it was minus twenty in yeah, right. in there, and yeah. sometimes below. And bearing in mind that Linda Blair is just in a, in a ninety yeah, right. uh, in that right. as well, yeah. and some of those and you know some of those kind of shots, you know, like ah, oh, like you just kind of really to produce what they wanted to do and you see this great I mean some of the scenes in it as well mm. amazing mm. and even like you know we were talking about the vomiting scene so mm. like you know that's a prosthetic that's put mm. across her face with a tube that inside out. that shot out a mm. uh, pea soup mm. um, you know and things like that and they had to do test markers to make sure that the, 
projectile actually landed on the right spot. <laughs> um, things like that. There was just so much that went into this movie. That's why I, you got to applaud it. It's, yeah. it's just a great piece of uh, filmmaking. Yeah. Um, I just, um, I don't know if I'm jumping around a bit here, so I was just looking at here, uh, it kind of goes back to what you, I think, again, Miles was saying about uh, not finding it a horror and not finding it scary. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, I think it was Blatty kind of said, if you believe that the world is evil and an evil place, you will find it uh, a haunting thing to watch. Or if you believe in the concept of God and the devil, then you would kind of believe these kind of things to be real and that these things are you know, are something to be played with. Whereas if you're going at it from an atheist kind of <coughs> point of view, you probably won't get that same kind of impact. So yeah. if you're thinking about the time it was released, again, going back to like, you know, skepticism wasn't as, it wasn't, yeah, it's you know, and religion was also a lot of a heightened thing at the time. People would be going into this kind of really kind of probably finding it very scary. And yeah, that's what yeah. probably resonates with them when you're asked, oh, what's the most scary film you've seen? Yeah, true. You kind of might think of those kind of ones. And I wonder, though, like you were saying also about, you know, it's been used a lot and you know, since then and parodied to, mm. to death. Has that lessened the people that were then going and watch it? I mean, you watch someone like Repossessed, you know. And, yeah, that was awful. Um, <laughs> but then when you watch that and then kind of then go back, does, does it change the way you look at the... Yeah, maybe, or... I don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of the yeah, maybe a lot of the, the fear that came out of it was the, the belief system. A lot of people were going that God is real, mm. the, the devil is as well. Um, I think that's yeah. Maybe how much of that was that? This could be you. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, all all of us, we we do ghost tours, right? We podcast yeah. ghost tours, and I'm I'm a skeptic. I'm an atheist. Um, the second Miles starts to see something. If Miles thinks there's a ghost in the room, he's the first one in there. I won't go near it. Yeah. So is, is that really? Well, what funny? does that say about you then? Yeah. I know because I'm going. I'm going up. Oh, puppy, puppy, chicken shit. But, I, but straight up, I'm vibing off. I'm vibing off. The fact Miles is trying to find out what the fuck he's saying, right? So that's yeah, why he's, yeah, yeah. So the scary aspect. Doesn't I think that's probably why I don't find it scary. Is that yeah. I, I'm constantly just um, inquisitive yeah. more than afraid of yeah. the unknown yeah. but you want to get a closer look at yeah. something you already seen I can't see it so I'm, I'm going in, my imagination is just going right now and I'm mm. going up on the result of like every, every scary movie I've ever seen and I yeah. just can't I just can't physically go in the room so I don't know yeah it's really interesting yeah <laughs> yeah. I guess there's, there's certain people who um, the, the, the cover pullers rather than the actual just yeah. get up and switch the light on to find out what's going on yeah, 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 yeah. and I'm going to switch the light on to find out what's going on type yeah. of person so you know I've had uh, in my last house, we heard a massive crash uh, one night, and Shelley goes, what is that? And I said, go and have a look. She's like, oh, because I was too tired. And she's like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sure it's something simple. She's like, go and have a look. So I'm looking around the house, and looking around the house, to go downstairs into the bathroom, to, which is our en suite, and just the light fixture just dropped out of the, the room, mm. basically, because mm. the, um, the one of the fixtures wasn't hitting mm. in properly and smashed all over the floor so mm. we woke up like three o'clock in the morning with this massive explosion yeah. glass sure. and so you know and I'm I'm the type of person that just gets up straight away even though I believe in ghosts and all that sort of supernatural stuff I just don't think that there's really anything other than horrible human beings yeah, that it's true. afraid of there was a so I, I think that's probably why um, that's probably why uh, <laughs> I get more scared if I watch Halloween well, if it's then, a person, yeah, yeah then it's a serial a person, killer. Yeah. Um, then yeah. if it's just a yeah. spirit or a That's demon right. attacking yeah. people. Well, it's like Paul and I have, we all have problems with films that sort of so graphically mm. gang rape or... Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't, watch, that can't watch any yeah. torture yeah. porn yeah. so yeah. I find yeah. it too... Yeah, I find even, like, you know, in The, the Accused, the... Uh, yeah, like, that's I, a That fucking, scene, I just... That's, that's oh, rough, things yeah. like that, I just can't. Like, yeah. I just... Oh, okay. I, yes, I can't. <laughs> I was just like... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't, but yeah, but as soon as you fucking throw a demon or an alien jumping in, sucking people's yeah. faces off with claws and shit, yeah, cool, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of people have asked who put the crucifix under the pillow. Because there's a, you know, they find, you know, there's a character that... Actually, how did Regan get possessed? So I can get back to that. Yeah. yeah. Ouija board at the very beginning. She's oh. Were they Ouija, were they? She was, yeah. See, that happened to a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, from ages ago. He um, he got possessed from a, a seance. Oh, really? Like, was, all the group got possessed. So there yeah. was, like, him and, I think, three friends just got mm. possessed. And they were, they were fucked, basically. What happened? Um... 
They're executives of like a high... <laughs> yeah. High power. This is 20 something years ago. Yeah. And, um, and from my... From what, what he told me, he said... Um, he, they did a seance. It went wrong. And it's... Like... It, he said he had Azrael, Azrael in him. And the demon Azrael. And... Really? That's quite high up. And, yeah... yeah. And that was, that was it. It was like, so he had this this thing in him, and he was at it, like he would levitate and do all this crazy. Shit. He read a book about it, but he, he tried to get it published, but I, I think he was a crap writer. <laughs> so, um, but his girlfriend was he a drug? Uh, they were into uh, weed and stuff like that. They were heavy okay. metal guys as well. So, right. um, but yeah, I know people who saw him when he was possessed, and they said he he was fucked up, like he went. And um, almost killed a guy in school once because yeah. um, it was a born again. The guy was a Christian guy, and he went after him. So how long was he trying to this? Uh, I think it was like t- uh, a month or two months or something. And was he just? But um, uh, no, no, he went to a uh, like a not a like a psychic, okay. uh, like a medium type pe- person, and the guy said he. This is a clear him, but he was like, the guy said, hold a crystal, hold this crystal in your hand, and we'll find out the level of, of possession. And if it goes purple, it's like, um, you know, you, you're possessed. And the thing went just the blackest of purple, mm. right at the center, and just started spreading it out. And basically, just the crystal snapped in, in half. Mm. And he goes, okay, so we're going to have to start dealing with this. And he, he didn't tell me what, what actually happened. He did barely, barely enough memory of the, of the whole situation. But yeah, mm. um, basically, the guy got the spirit out of him, and it was Azrael. But it, we didn't go to churches or anything. He, he had a bunch of spirit guys, mm. and he was never really quiet. So he was saying again, and he, the the other guys that he was friends with, he never spoke to them again. Again, right. like all of them, like they all just moved away from each other. Right. So they just split to different sides of the country. Wow. I, yeah. I, like I mean, I I was friends with him for a few years after that happened, oh. and and he at one stage he said, "Oh, you." Yeah, his girlfriend was like, I read a book, he read a book of it, you should read it, it's amazing. Mm. Uh, and and I never got a chance to read the book, but I did harass him constantly about it, and then moved away from Campbelltown, so it was like, but it all happened around Campbelltown, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, that's one thing I will never go near. We'll never so go near. No, I oh. won't, won't do it. Campbelltown. Yeah. Campbelltown, yeah. 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 That's it. No, I, won't, I can't. I, like, you could ask me to. I won't, no, it's won't, fucked up. Can't I've do done it. some horrible seances. No, I won't, won't just, ever do it. They, they just turn quite nasty. Yeah. I've been in the worst one I ever was in. It took us like three hours <laughs> to get rid of this fucking horrible piece of shit demon. Yeah. And it was just taunting everybody. and It changed people's lives in the room. Mm. Uh, and changed what, like... We were 15, 16 years old, and pretty much everybody was affected by it yeah. in the room. It was like a quite large room. It was like 10 people in the room. And it was like one guy was about to um, head off and join the army and, and go overseas. Yeah. And he quit that the next day because the guy told him that he was going to die in Northern Ireland. And, uh, and basically said, told him the date of when he was going to die and where he would be and blah, oh. blah, and what it was for. And he was like, fuck, that's it. I'm out of here. And another guy was like, his uh, brother died in the house and he said he had his brother here rotting away with him and he was just like nobody knew that the ki- the, the kid's um, brother had died in the house yeah. except him yeah, yeah, and we were like what the fuck is this guy you know and he goes he died and started, and started telling all the details it was like fucking crazy shit glasses just started like sm- smashing basically yeah, yeah, and it was just like just go away go away and it was like me and there was another guy who, who now works as a professional uh, like Reiki and medium. Oh, and yeah, yeah. So he was there too, and there was another guy, a, a girl that was into it as well. And she's a, I think she's a Wiccan um, okay. witch now. But she's like, all of us are trying to get rid of this fucking thing. Mm-hmm. And she just could not get And we were like, do not break the circle, anybody. Do not break the circle. So we just shut the room off. And we just, there was like people having a party in the, in the next room. And we just locked every do- like the doors to the to the room, and we just stopped everybody from leaving. And yeah, so yeah. It's, nobody's going out until this fucking thing goes. Yeah. And it was horrible. And just I never, I never, never did a seance for about four, three or four years afterwards. Yeah. And then um, no, I fucked up and did it again for it, and just like, do it to pick three people out. Yeah, yeah. But um, I just won't. I can't. That yeah. to me, that's just you're tempting fate with it. I just won't go there. That's yeah. All. 
twenty two. No, it's something you do when you're younger, but it's just yeah. it is stupid. Mm. And unless you know what um, you're doing, yeah, that's the you thing. should not even be going on your own. The kids should should not be going on your Ouija boards or creating their because we just create our own Ouija boards. Yeah. Mm. And um and just fuck around and you know if you're gonna do it and and you want to scare the shit out, do it, scare the shit out of people. You can do it quite easily. You can move the glass around yeah. quite easily. Yeah. But then just don't don't do it seriously because yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. fuck yeah things up. And it's quite easy to, to suddenly get latched on to something if you accidentally do the right, do the right thing, yeah. and suddenly capture something, then you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you know how to get rid of it. So with the movie, yeah, at the beginning they're down in the uh, in like the basement, right? Okay. And okay, they uh, Reagan kind of mm. has the Ouija board thing, and the mum asks her, "Oh, what's this?" And she goes, "Are you been Are you been doing this?" And, and there's a bit where um, she goes, um, "So what do you do?" And so they she sits it down. With the mum, right? And she goes, and so she goes like, "It's Captain Howdy. That's what I've been oh, talking right, to." Right, 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 right. And um, and she goes, and she goes, um, ask her the question. I think she says so, and then she, then Regan says, "Is my mum pretty?" And nothing happens, and so Regan just goes, "That's not funny, Captain Howdy," as in because she's he's not responding. Right, right. Um, and so, and that's kind of it. That's just a very kind of small scene, very early on. Yeah. But I, then you know, and she. But she tells her mum that she's been doing it with some of her friends for a little while. Uh, so this is where it, it's... It kicks off. Yeah. From there. So that's another thing, too. It's sitting moving in the roof as well, isn't it? It's like yeah, there's a scene where she goes up, because she thinks it's rats yeah. in, right. in the roof. Yeah, and so right. there's that great scene where the flame of the can, uh, you know, the candle thing mm. yeah. really sparks up. But yeah, that's... Yeah, there's all these she sees a statue or something in the roof, like yeah. a demon in the roof. Yeah. Yeah, there's a that's another big thing that get done gets done a lot is that the demon always goes for the young as a child. Yeah, and it's yeah. always an imaginary friend called Toby or mm. something silly like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah they do Toby's from um, Paranormal Activity. Ouija, Ouija, the origin of evil yeah, as well. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say that. I, mean, I yeah. still haven't seen that. That's great. Yeah, I, kind of. I, I liked it. It was good. I, was, I think <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, no, I thought oh. it was great. Well, it was good. It's certainly better than the first one. But yeah, I haven't watched the first one. first one is a typical I can see how age. it fits in with the first one. They did They did a good job, because I'd forgotten mm. what the twist in the first one was about, which is because it's a prequel. Mm. And I actually had to go back to Wikipedia and go, oh, that's right. Oh, okay, they've made it up. The only thing they did wrong was that they took the 10 years out of sync. Right. Because in, in, in the first movie, the woman in the prequel mm. it happened in the 40s, and they had to move it up. Oh, okay. for it to match. That's only really good. But they actually did quite a good job of tying it up yeah. correctly and still be quite scary as it kind of mm. um, But yeah, the, the, the innocent through her friends, because Poltergeist is so awesome because mm. um, she talks to friends on the other side. Yeah. They speak like a child speaks. Yeah. yeah. That's how they get in. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So so there's a lot of questions about who, who was it that put the crucifix under the pillow? Right, right. Because they, you know... Uh, Helen Bursting. Well, that's what she finds. The oh, she uses the stab herself. Well, no, she kind of she kind of finds it first. It's yeah. not when it's using that. And they yeah. said, well, who who put it? Because it's under Regan's pillow. Right. And she kind of finds it and says, who put that there? And asks everyone. Well, everyone denies it essentially. Oh, baby. And so we never really yeah. know. Well, so so a lot of people go, well, hold on. So who actually did put the crucifix there? Because it right. must have gotten there somehow. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of people have questioned whether it was Carl. The, you know, there's the German kind of guy that she's the guy that keeps telling, like the caretaker essentially at the house, oh, right, okay. and told told him to get rid of the rats, and he's like, "There's no rats in the, right, okay, in the attic." Right, right, right. A lot of people have said it's him, and in the book it insinuates it's him, right, and okay. that he's been playing around with dark magic, and that's how it gets into oh, the house. Oh, I see. Um, but it's not; it's very un, underplayed in this one. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so that's something that I was just thought I'd mention. Um, the other thing is also like uh, going just going back to Stahl, um, um Freakin said that he's uh, at the time was really influenced by the works of Antononi um, and his stuff. So if you kind of look at that, there's a lot of these kind of long kind of shots, cityscape kind of shots and things that you can kind of see. And, and the pacing of it too is very kind of reminiscent of his work. Mm. Um, and also we didn't mention this, but Lee J. Cobb's in this. Um, so he's the guy that plays the detective. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. He's in like on the waterfront and yeah, like, yeah, massive, yeah, massive yeah, actor, yeah. like really, Bob really good. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's brilliant, brilliant yeah, actor, and yeah. he's playing right. the detective in this. Very kind of. If you watch those scenes that he's in, he's quite a quirky kind of character, yeah. and really yeah. kind of grounded. And he has this kind of play with both the younger priests in it and the dialogue and stuff. And um, 
a lot of people have said there's after the fact um because Columbo came out mm. and people have said have likened the similarity between the mm-hmm. two detectives and saying uh, did Peter Falk kind of lift off that mm-hmm. performance because it's very similar in the, in the style mm-hmm. of approach that he went about just a kind of question yeah mm-hmm. so actually Lee J. Cobb ended up being the only name attached to this film like so it's going back to what I said yeah. about how it was originally meant to have been like oh, the likes of yeah, Anne Bancroft and Jack Nicholson and, oh, and yeah. Lee J. Cobb was attached and he's the at the end he's the only <laughs> uh, known actor by that point he's played so, by a different actor for the third time Barry no. uh, who's the guy that played with General Patton in Joseph Scott yeah Joseph Scott yeah, yeah, sorry him. thank yeah. you I'm blank yeah. um, so, so I know that we've been talking quite uh, quite a bit on this so, so just cover, kind of might run out kind of a last few bits and pieces on it um, the famous kind of shot that we see of um, of uh, the exorcist he turns up outside the house with the light, kind of lamp light kind of shining shot. down so that's actually inspired by uh, a painting that's mm. called Empire of Light by Rene Magritte um, so it's uh, and when you look at it it is literally like it's a street street scene like uh, there's a lot more houses in it mm. but there's just this one lamp light that's projecting this uh, wow. light across and you kind of go yeah I get the inspiration behind mm. that um, and it was just something that he, uh, William Friedkin, had stumbled across in an art museum when he was walking around, and obviously like the image stuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the most iconic images. I mean, it made yeah, the, the front cover of the, of the, the film poster and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Um, a lot of it's, uh, as I've said, mentioned about the audio, uh, actual audio recordings from exorcisms that were sent from the Vatican that were used. Um, faith, are essentially, is what's been used in this. The whole way through it, it's about faith. And faith is eventually triumphed over evil, which is why it's important to show the St. Joseph medal at the very end when uh, the priest character um, has, you know, no, she goes to give it to the priest. Mm. Oh, That's what she kisses around. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. gives him the, the thing and then um, he says, keep it. And then they stop the guy and they say, no, you keep it. So it's kind of like almost, it's like a, the mantle being passed on to the other yeah. priest. Mm. Like he's the protector now. He's got a, he's, he's the word of God. Mm-hmm. And it's his role now to kind of mm. keep that harmony in place. Um, but there are deliberate hints that evil has not yet been completely yeah. ridden from this earth. Um, and the battle between good and evil is, in a, is eternal and will always be thus. Trying to almost kind of say that everything's balanced, but there's this intonation and in the music and mm-hmm. the way it's kind of shot is that everything isn't quite right still, like, it's just this is just one instance of yeah. of a of a battle that's Obviously. taken place, and also because it pans back up and way out. All that you know, never oh. can never be the same again. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, exactly. Like she's always going to be scarred. evil, and, and you yeah. can't, you can never be the same again. That's right. Like, you know, and and the priest war. himself, yeah. like the it's like there was a bit of the end. Like cut originally had cut that ends the end bit where he's having the banter with the detective. It wasn't in in there, mm. and then when they kind of added it. He just said it needs to be there. Like I think Blatty was the one that pushed for it. He said you kind of need that because you need that moment where people feel like there's balance. Balance has been restored, mm. even though the, <laughs> even though there's a question mark around yeah. around stuff. You kind of the audience just need that, and that's why that sparring relationship needed to happen at the very end. It's a very common theme. Go back to Lord of the Rings. The whole point of Lord of the Rings, anyway, touches the ring, they're scared for life. Mm. And, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's why Fredo and, and Sam have to go to the Undying Lands mm. because they have to. Cause yeah, they want the best guy and the best life. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a common thing for a lot of. Well, um, they've, they've the essentially story. they've been to war. Yeah, and yeah. With, against the evil, mm. and you can never be right after yeah. you're going to war. It's a yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a PTSD of. Yeah. It's the same, that. yeah. Then that's the same thing. Like they in this in the Exorcist, they've gone to war and um, battle with a demon. Yeah, exactly. And so you're gonna come out scarred at the other end. And so, it's, it's, I love it. It's interesting. Yeah. That, that, that's a choice you make. You know, yeah. Going full well, that you fight the other way if you win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is again the thing about the Merrin thing. I really love that because the, the the thing about those things is you always see again in other movies too when a priest that the experienced priest comes in and the demon goes high again. It's that that concept mm-hmm. of like. Yeah, you, you've won, but you're going to come up with this guy again. And they'll remember you, too. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a whole... The, the sense, I remember, that again, watching it as a kid, the sense of old adversaries meeting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Merrin knows he doesn't have another fight left in him. No, that's right. But he will do it anyway. Yeah. And again, it's, and like, parallel to all the things, like, you know, I've talked about that scene in Gandalf, 
It's not written in the books, but it's done very well by Peter Jackson in the movie that Gandalf will not go to the land to the mines of yes. He knows yeah. he's going to die there. He's seen it. Yeah. And he's trying to fight every inch of the way. I don't want to go there. And then the other guy said, look, we've got to go to the fox. <laughs> if you don't, he's like, okay. <laughs> and, and when the, the, more, the, the battle comes around the corner, that look on his face is like, okay, it's happening. I'm going to die now. Mm. It's just a really lovely moment where he just breaks down. And you know, they've just gone through hell to get to that moment, and you now he's still going to die. Um, and I love it. I think that's that's a really classic hero's journey for him to do you know, in, in many different shapes and forms. Mm, mm. To, to go and say, well, this is my life, you know? Mm. Um, um, and it's not just being selfless, too. It's, it's just, like, in the case of Mary, he, you know, he's not going to let a dog go. And it's a horrible way he's going to die. Yeah. And, um, and it's almost, too, you feel for it, too, that, that he's dedicated his life to the church. Yeah. Which is a very selfless thing to do because the church will take an awful lot from you, and and this is well, it's the nature yeah. of you know the Christian, especially Catholicism, is all about sacrifice. You yeah. Know? yeah. So it's just one more sacrifice he has to make. Yeah. yeah. But it's, uh, I do remember that being a very powerful. Mm. Yeah. I do remember that bit where he said, "Take a break." Yeah. And, and feeling from mm. the Christ's point of view, really betrayed that. How did you go back? Well, how dare you go back inside? Yeah. 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 But just he's so weak. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah, I can't let you do this, young man, because you're up for it. Yeah. Mm. Let's go. It, yeah, that, I remember. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Very Absolutely. Very yeah. Absolutely. I think that's the thing. I think the, the, the film resonates, and I mm. think that's why it still stands up today. Mm. People will watch it, and they, they're still something that lingers with you mm. after watching it. I think that's why it's, it's, it's powerful. It's a powerful film. Mm. Mm. No, it's very well crafted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's great. Oh, yeah. Genuinely. 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 Okay, cool. yeah, so it's, as adults, I saw it as adults. Oh, yeah, it looked yeah. more than a horror film. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. it's yeah. actually a good work. It's a work yeah. about it. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's a solid piece of, like, I mean, as I say, it's a thriller, so it's like... Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting, too, because we, we, we make short films, we make 30-second commercials. To make a feature of this film, for it to be seen as a great film, it's not just one thing that makes it great, it's mm. just things that come together, like the art direction that came Yeah. Out. The director came, right? He found the right cast. Yeah. Mm. Linda Blair's great. Like, she was the perfect kid for it. Yeah. It all coincided with stories. Yeah. What the, I, there was one thing that came across was a bit cheesy for me that did take me out of it was the reflection of the demon in the, in the cook. Oh, the cook the kitchen. Top. Yeah, yeah. And there's a section. I don't think I'll talk what the hell's that. <laughs> Um, I love that demon. So, <laughs> yeah, as you yeah, know, yeah. no, I, I, yeah, um, so, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm turning it into a short film. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> right. that was only, that's the only thing that took me out of it. But, yeah. but, 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 but sorry, it wasn't. Pazuzu is the name of the, oh, okay, of, right. is of the demon that we see. But, um, it's like that, that thing I always tell you when a disaster happened, it isn't like, like when a ship has lost at sea. It's not mm. one thing that makes a ship lost at sea. So, it happen mm. and like the, the, the engine breaks down and things like that. I can't remember who said it, but some, either Bloody or Freaking said, there is a movie god that helps with the casting. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think everything came right Yeah, that film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is what I'm saying. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Great film. Yeah. Cool. Paul, and done. any any other no, thoughts on it? All done. talked out. Woo! Miles <laughs> all right. Look, so yeah. thanks very much. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed our little kind of uh, banter around that. So um, this is the Surgeon of Horror podcast. Our discussion was on The Exorcist, and what we do hope to do is revisit The Exorcist 2, The Heretic, and The Exorcist 3, as I said, as one podcast, and we'll have a look at the, uh, the, other, the other newer <laughs> movies too. Um, but thanks again, and uh, yeah, just stay tuned and listen out for us down the tracks. This is Paul Farrell, The Badger. Goodbye. Anthony Yee. Big Cheese. And, and Miles oh. Davies. <laughs> Thank you very much, fellas. Goodbye. You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. The Exorcist franchise. The Exorcist. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts, head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.